Chapter Twenty Nine of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter Twenty Nine: How Brother Gorenflot Changed His Ass for a Mule and His Mule for a Horse. However, Gorenflot's troubles were near their end for that day, for after the detour they went on a mile and then stopped at a rival hotel. Chicot took a room which looked on to the high road and ordered supper, but even while he was eating he was constantly on the watch. However, at ten o'clock, as he had seen nothing, he went to bed, first, however, ordering that the horse and the ass should be ready at daybreak. "'At daybreak?' uttered Gorenflot with a deep sigh. "'Yes, you must be used to getting up at that time.' "'Why so?' "'For matins.' "'I had an exemption from the superior.' Chicot ordered Gorenflot's bed to be placed in his room. With the daylight he was up and at the window, and before very long he saw three mules coming along. He ran to Gorenflot and shook him. "'Can I not have a moment's rest?' cried the monk, who had been sleeping for ten hours. "'Be quick, get up and dress, for we are going.' "'But the breakfast?' "'Is on the road to Monterau. "'Where is Monterau? It is the city where we breakfast. That is enough for you. Now, I am going down to pay the bill, and if you are not ready in five minutes, I will go without you. A monk's toilet takes not long. However, Gorenflow took six minutes, and when he came down, Chicot was starting. This day passed much like the former one, and by the third, Gorenflow was beginning to get accustomed to it, when towards the evening Chicot lost all his gaiety. Since noon he had seen nothing of the three travelers. Therefore he was in a very bad humor. They were off at daybreak and galloped till noon. But all in vain, no mules were visible. Chicot stopped at a turnpike and asked the man if he had seen three travelers pass on mules. Not today, was the reply. Yesterday evening, about seven. What were they like? They looked like a master and two servants. It was them, said Chicot. Ventre de biche! They have twelve hours start of me. But courage. Listen, Monsieur Chicot, said Gorenflot, my ass can do no more. Even your horse is almost exhausted. Chicot looked and saw, indeed, that the poor animals were trembling from head to foot. Well, brother, said he, we must take a resolution. You must leave me. Leave you? Why? You go too slow. Slow? why we have galloped for five hours this morning that is not enough well then let us go on the quicker we go the sooner we shall arrive for i suppose we shall stop at last but our animals are exhausted what shall we do then leave them here and take them as we come back then how are we to proceed we will buy mules very well said Gorenflot with a sigh. Two mules were soon found, and they went so well that in the evening Chicot saw with joy those of the three travelers, standing at the door of a farrier's. But they were without harness, and both master and lackeys had disappeared. Chicot trembled. Go, said he to Gorenflot, and ask if those mules are for sale, and where their owners are. Gorenflot went, and soon returned, saying that a gentleman had sold them, and had afterwards taken the road to Avignon. Alone? No, with a lackey. And where is the other lackey? He went towards Lyon. And how did they go on? On horses which they bought. Of whom? Of a captain of troopers who was here, and they sold their mules to a dealer who is trying to sell them again to those Franciscan monks whom you see there. Well, Take our two mules, and go and offer them to the monks instead. They ought to give you the preference. But then how shall we go on? On horseback, more bleu. Diable. Oh, a good rider like you. You will find me again on the Grand Place. Chicot was bargaining for some horses when he saw the monk reappear, carrying the saddles and bridles of the mules. Oh, you have kept the harness? yes and sold the mules for ten pistoles each which they paid you here is the money ventre de biche 
you're a great man let us go on but i am thirsty well drink while i saddle the beasts but not too much a bottle very well Cornflow drank too and came to give the rest of the money back to chicot who felt half inclined to give it to him but reflecting that if Gorenflot had money he would no longer be obedient, he refrained. They rode on, and the next evening Chicot came up with Nicolas David, still disguised as a lackey, and kept him in sight all the way to Lyon, whose gates they all three entered on the eighth day after their departure from Paris. End of chapter 29 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter Thirty of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter Thirty: How Chicot and his companion installed themselves at the Hotel of the Cross, and how they were received by the host. Chicot watched Nicolas David into the principal hotel of the place, and then said to Gorenflot, "Go in and bargain for a private room." Say that you expect your brother, then come out and wait about for me, and I will come in when it is dark, and you can bring me straight to my room. Do you understand? Perfectly. Choose a good room as near as possible to that of the traveler who has just arrived. It must look on to the street, and on no account pronounce my name. Gornflow acquitted himself marvelously of the commission. Their room was only separated by a partition from that of Nicolas David. You deserve a recompense said Chicot to him, and you shall have sherry wine for supper. I never got tipsy on that wine. It would be agreeable. You shall tonight, but now ramble about the town. But for supper? I shall be ready against your return. Here is a crown, meanwhile. Gornflow went off quite happy, and then Chicot made with a gimlet a hole in the partition at about the height of his eye. Through this he could hear distinctly all that passed, and he could just see the host talking to Nicolas David, who was professing to have been sent on a mission by the king, to whom he professed great fidelity. The host did not reply, but Chicot fancied he could see an ironical smile on his lip whenever the king's name was mentioned. "'Is he a leaguer?' thought Chicot. "'I will find out.' When the host left David, he came to visit Chicot, who said, pray sit down monsieur and before we make a definitive arrangement listen to my history you saw me this morning with a monk yes monsieur silence that monk is proscribed what is he a disguised huguenot chicot took an offended air huguenot indeed he is my relation and i have no huguenot relations on the contrary, he is so fierce an enemy of the Huguenots that he has fallen into disgrace with His Majesty Henry the Third, who protects them, as you know. The host began to look interested. Silence, said he. Why, have you any of the king's people here? I fear so. There is a traveler in there. Then we must fly at once, for proscribed, menaced. Where will you go? We have two or three addresses given to us by an innkeeper we know, Monsieur La Hurriera. Do you know La Hurriera? Yes, we made his acquaintance on the night of St. Bartholomew. Well, I see you and your relation are holy people. I also know La Hurriera. Then you say this monk had the imprudence to preach against the Huguenots, and with so much success that the king wanted to put him in prison. And then? Ma foi, I carried him off. And you did well. Monsieur de Guise offered to protect him. What? The great Henri? Himself, but I feared civil war. If you are friends of Monsieur de Guise, you know this. And he made a sort of Masonic sign by which the leaguers recognized each other. Chicot, who had seen both this and the answer to it twenty times during that famous night, replied, "'And you this?' "'Then,' said the innkeeper, "'you are at home here. My house is yours. Look on me as a brother, and if you have no money—' Chicot drew out his purse. The sight of a well-filled purse is always agreeable even to a generous host. "'Our journey,' continued Chicot, "'is paid for by the treasurer of the Holy Union, for we travel to propagate the faith.' Tell us of an inn where we may be safe. 
Oh, nowhere more so than here, and if you wish it, the other traveler shall turn out. Oh, no. It is better to have your enemies near, that you may watch them. But what makes you think he is our enemy? Well, first he came disguised as a lackey. Then he put on an advocate's dress. And I am sure he is no more an advocate than he is a lackey, for I saw a long rapier under his cloak. Then he avowed he had a mission from the king. From Herod, as I call him. Sardanapalus. Bravo! Ah! I see we understand each other. Then we are to remain here? I should think so. Not a word about my relation. Of course not. Nor of me. Oh, no, but hush. Here is someone. Oh, it is the worthy man himself. The host turned to Gorenflot and made a sign of the leaguers. Gorenflot was struck with terror and astonishment. Reply, my brother, said Chicot. He is a member. Of what? Of the Holy Union, said Bernouillet in a low tone. You see, all is safe. Reply, said Chicot. Gorenflot replied to the great joy of the innkeeper. But, said Gorenflot, who did not like the conversation, you promised me some sherry. Sherry, Malaga, Alicant, every wine in my cellar is at your disposal. Gorenflot looked at Chicot in amazement. For three following days, Gorenflot got drunk, first on Sherry, next on Malaga, then on Alicant. Afterwards, he declared he liked Burgundy best, and returned to that. Meanwhile, Chicot had never stirred from his room and had constantly watched Nicolas David, who, having appointed to meet Pierre de Gondy at this inn, would not leave the house. On the morning of the sixth day, he declared himself ill, and the next day worse. Bernouillet came joyfully to tell Chicot. What? Do you think him in danger? High fever, my dear brother. He is delirious and tried to strangle me and beat my servants. The doctors do not understand his complaint. Have you seen him? Yes, I tell you, he tried to strangle me. How did he seem? Pale and furious and constantly crying out. What? Take care of the king. They want to hurt the king. Then he constantly says that he expects a man from Avignon and wishes to see him before he dies. As for Gorenflot, he grew visibly fatter every day, so much so that he announced to Chicot with terror one day that the staircase was narrowing. Neither David, the League, nor religion occupied him. He thought of nothing but how to vary his dinner and wine, so that Vernouillet often exclaimed in astonishment, to think that that man should be a torrent of eloquence. End of chapter 30. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 31 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 31. How the Monk Confessed the Advocate and the Advocate the Monk. At last, Monsieur Bernouillet came into Chicot's room, laughing immoderately. "'He is dying,' said he, "'and the man has arrived from Avignon.' "'Have you seen him?' "'Of course.' "'What is he like?' "'Little and thin.' "'It is he,' thought Chicot, and he said, "'Tell me about his arrival.' "'An hour ago I was in the kitchen when I saw a great horse, ridden by a little man, stop before the door.' "'Is Monsieur Nicolas here?' he asked. "'Yes, Monsieur,' said I. "'Tell him that the person he expects from Avignon is here.' "'Certainly, Monsieur, but I must warn you that he is very ill. "'All the more reason for doing my bidding at once. "'But he has a malignant fever. "'Oh, pray, then, be quick. "'How, you persist?' "'I persist. "'In spite of the danger? "'In spite of everything, I must see him.' So I took him to the room, and there he is now. Is it not odd? Very droll. I wish I could hear them. Go in. He forbade me to go in, saying he was going to confess. Listen at the door. Bernouillet went, and Chicot went also to his hole, but they spoke so low that he could hear nothing, and in a few minutes Gondy rose and took leave. 
Chicot ran to the window and saw a lackey waiting with a horse which Monsieur de Gondi mounted and rode off. If he only has not carried off the genealogy. Never mind, I shall soon catch him if necessary, but I suspect it is left here. Where can Gornflow be? Monsieur Bounillet returned, saying, He is gone. The confessor? He is no more confessor than I am. Will you send me my brother as soon as he comes in? Even if he be drunk? Whatever state he is in. Bernouillet went, and Chicot remained in a state of indecision as to what to do, for he thought, if David is really so ill, he may have sent on the dispatches by Gondi. Presently he heard Gorenflot's voice singing a drinking song as he came up the stairs. Silence, drunkard, said Chicot. Drunkard indeed. Yes, but come here and speak seriously, if you can. What is it now? It is that you never think of the duties of your profession, that you wallow in greediness and drunkenness and let religion go where it pleases. Gornflow looked astonished. I? He gasped. Yes, you. You are disgraceful to see. You are covered with mud. You have been drunk in the streets. It is too true. If you go on so, I will abandon you. Chico, my friend, you will not do that. Am I very guilty? There are archers at Lyon. Oh, pity, my dear protector, pity. Are you a Christian or not? I, not a Christian. Then do not let a neighbor die without confession. I am ready. But I must drink first, for I am thirsty. Chicot passed him a jug of water, which he emptied. Now, who am I to confess? Our unlucky neighbor who is dying. Let them give him a pint of wine with honey in it. He needs spiritual aid as well as temporal. Go to him. Am I fit? said Gornflow timidly. Perfectly. Then I will go. Stay, I must tell you what to do. Oh, I know. You do not know what I wish. What do you wish? If you execute it well, I will give you one hundred pistoles to spend here. What must I do? Listen, your robe gives you authority in the name of God and the king. Summon him to give up the papers he has just received from Avignon. What for? To gain one hundred pistoles, stupid. Ah, true. I go. Wait a minute. He will tell you he has confessed. But if he has? Tell him he lies, that the man who has just left him is no confessor, but an intriguer like himself. But he will be angry. What does that matter, since he is dying? True. Well, one way or the other, you must get a hold of those papers. If he refuses? Refuse him absolution. Curse him. Anathematize him. Oh, I will take them by force. Good, and when you have got them, knock on the wall. And if I cannot get them? Knock also. Then, in any case, I am to knock? Yes. Gornflow went, and Chicot placed his ear to the hole in the wall. When Gornflow entered, the sick man raised himself in his bed and looked at him with wonder. "'Good day, brother,' said Gornflow. "'What do you want, my father?' murmured the sick man in a feeble voice. "'My son, I hear you are in danger, and I come to speak to you of your soul.' "'Thank you, but I think your care is needless.' I feel better. You think so? I am sure of it. It is a ruse of Satan who wishes you to die without confession. Then he will be deceived, for I have just confessed. To whom? To a worthy priest from Avignon. He was not a priest. Not? No. How do you know? I knew him. You knew the man who has just gone by? Yes, 
and as you are not better, and this man was not a priest, you must confess. Very well, replied the patient in a stronger voice, but I will choose to whom I will confess. You will have no time to send for another priest, and I am here. How? No time when I tell you I am getting well? Gorenflot shook his head. I tell you, my son, you are condemned by the doctors and by providence. You may think it cruel to tell you so, but it is what we must all come to sooner or later. Confess, my son, confess. But I assure you, father, that I feel much stronger. A mistake, my son, the lamp flares up at the last, just before it goes out. Come, confess all your plots, your intrigues, and machinations. My intrigues and plots, cried David, frightened at this singular monk whom he did not know, but who seemed to know him so well. Yes, and when you have told all that, give me up the papers, and perhaps God will let me absolve you. What papers? cried the sick man in a voice as strong as though he were quite well. The papers that the pretended priest brought you from heaven yon. And who told you that he brought me papers? cried the patient, putting one leg out of bed. Gorenflot began to feel frightened, but he said firmly, He who told me knew well what he was saying. Give me the papers, or you shall have no absolution. I laugh at your absolution, cried David, jumping out of bed and seizing Gorenflot by the throat, and you shall see if I am too ill to strangle you. Gorenflot was strong and he pushed David back so violently that he fell into the middle of the room. But he rose furious, and seizing a long-sword which hung on the wall behind his clothes, presented it to the throat of Gorenflot, who sank on a chair in terror. "'It is now your turn to confess,' said he. "'Speak, or you die.' "'Oh!' cried Gorenflot. "'Then you are not ill, not dying?' "'It is not for you to question, but to answer.' "'To answer for what?' who you are. You can see that. Your name? Brother Gorenflow. You are then a real monk? I should think so. What brings you to Lyon? I am exiled. What brought you to this inn? Chance. How long have you been here? A fortnight. Why did you watch me? I did not. How did you know that I had the papers? Because I was told so. Who told you? He who sent me here. Who was that? I cannot tell you. You must. Oh, oh, I will cry out. And I will kill. Gorenflow cried out, and a spot of blood appeared on the point of the sword. His name? cried David. Oh, I can hold out no more. Speak. It was Chicot. The king's jester? Himself. And where is he? Here, cried a voice, and Chicot appeared at the door with a drawn sword in his hand. End of chapter 31. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter thirty two of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter thirty two How Chicot Used His Sword. Nicolas David, in recognizing him whom he knew to be his mortal enemy, could not repress a movement of terror, during which Gorenflow slipped a little to the side, crying out, Help, friend, come to my aid. Ah, Monsieur David, is it you? said Chicot. I am delighted to meet you again. Then, turning to Gorenflow, he said, My good Gorenflow, your presence as a monk was very necessary just now, when we believed Monsieur dying. But now that he is so well, it is with me he must deal. Therefore, do me the favor to stand sentinel on the threshold, and prevent anyone from coming in to interrupt our little conversation. Gorenflow, who asked no better than to go, was soon out of the room. But David, having now recovered from his surprise and confident in his skill as a swordsman, stood waiting for Chicot with his sword in his hand and a smile on his lips. 
"'Dress yourself, monsieur,' said Chicot. "'I do not wish to take any advantage of you. "'Do you know what I have come to seek in this room?' The rest of the blows which I have owed you on account of the Duc de Mayenne since that day when you jumped so quickly out of the window. No, monsieur, I know the number and will return them. Be easy. What I have come for is a certain genealogy which Monsieur Pierre de Gandhi took to Avignon, without knowing what he carried, and equally in ignorance, brought back to you just now. David turned pale. What genealogy? he said. That of Monsieur de Guise, who descends, as you know, in a direct line from Charlemagne. Ah, you are a spy. I thought you only a buffoon. Dear Monsieur David, I will be both, if you wish it, a spy to hang you, and a buffoon to laugh at after. To hang me? High and dry, Monsieur. I hope you do not lay claim to be beheaded like a gentleman. And how will you do it? Oh, very easily. I will relate the truth, for I must tell you, dear Monsieur David, that I assisted last month at the meeting held in the convent of St. Genevieve. You? Yes, I was in the confessional in front of yours, and it was very uncomfortable there, especially as I was obliged to wait to go out until all was finished. Therefore I heard all, saw the coronation of Monsieur d'Anjou, which was not very amusing, but then the genealogy was delightful. Ah, uh, you know about the genealogy cried david biting his lips with anger yes and i found it very ingenious especially that part about the salic law only it is a misfortune to have so much intellect one gets hung for it therefore feeling myself moved with tender pity for so ingenious a man i said to myself shall i let this brave monsieur david be hung and i took the resolution of traveling with or rather behind you I followed you, therefore not without trouble, and at last we arrived at Lyon. I entered the hotel an hour after you, and have been in the adjoining room. Look, there is only a partition between, and as you may imagine, I did not travel all the way from Paris to Lyon to lose sight of you now. I pierced a little hole through which I had the pleasure of watching you when I liked, and I confess I gave myself this pleasure several times a day. At last you fell ill. The host wished to get rid of you, but you were determined to wait here for Monsieur de Gondy. I was duped by you at first, for you might really have been ill, so I sent you a brave monk to excite you to repentance. But hardened sinner that you are, you tried to kill him, forgetting the scripture maxim. He who strikes with the sword shall perish with the sword. Then I came to you and said, We are old friends, let us arrange the matter in what manner it would be a pity that such a man as you should disappear from the world give up plots trust me break with the guises give me your papers and on the faith of a gentleman i will make your peace with the king while on the contrary if i do not give them to you ah then on the faith of a gentleman i will kill you but if you give them to me all shall be forgotten you do not believe me, perhaps, for your nature is bad, and you think my resentment can never be forgotten. But although it is true that I hate you, I hate Monsieur de Mayenne more, give me what will ruin him, and I will save you. And then, perhaps, you will not believe this either, for you love nothing. But I love the king, foolish and corrupted as he is, and I wish that he should reign tranquilly, which is impossible with the Mayenne and the genealogy of Nicolas David. Therefore, give me up the genealogy, and I promise to make your name and your fortune. David never moved. Well, said Chicot, I see all that I say to you is but wasted breath. Therefore, I go to get you hanged. Adieu, Monsieur David. And he stepped backwards toward the door. And you think I shall let you go out? cried the advocate. No, no, my fine spy. No, no, Chicot, my friend, those who know of the genealogy must die. Those who menace me must die. You put me quite at my ease. I hesitated only because I am sure to kill you. Crillon, the other day, taught me a particular thrust, only one, but that will suffice. Come, give me the papers, or I will kill you, and I will tell you how. I will pierce your throat just where you wish to bleed Gorenflot. 
Chicot had hardly finished when David rushed on him with a savage laugh. The two adversaries were nearly matched in height, but Chicot, who fenced nearly every day with the king, had become one of the most skillful swordsmen in the kingdom. David soon began to perceive this, and he retreated a step. Aha! said Chicot. Now you begin to understand. Once more, the papers. David, for answer, threw himself again upon Chicot, and a new combat ensued. At last Chicot called out, Here is the thrust! And as he spoke, he thrust his rapier half through his throat. David did not reply, but fell at Chicot's feet, pouring out a mouthful of blood. But by a natural movement he tried to drag himself toward the bed, so as to defend his secret to the last. Ha <laughs> ha! cried Chicot. I thought you cunning, but I see you are a fool. I did not know where the papers were, and you have shown me. And while David rolled in the agonies of death, he ran to the bed, raised the mattress, and found under it a roll of parchment. At the moment in which he unrolled it to see if it was the document he sought, David raised himself in a rage, and then fell back dead. Chicot saw with joy that he held what he wanted. The Pope had written at the bottom, Fiat ut volia Deus, Deus jura hominum fecit. After placing it in his breast, he took the body of the advocate, who had died without losing more blood, the nature of the wound making him bleed inwardly, put it back in the bed, turned the face to the wall, and opening the door called Gorenflow. "'How pale you are!' said the monk as he entered. "'Yes, the last moments of that man caused me some emotion.' "'Then he is dead?' "'Yes.' He was so well just now. Too well. He swallowed something difficult of digestion and died of it. The wretch wanted to strangle me, a holy man, and he is punished for it. Pardon him. You are a Christian. I do, although he frightened me much. You must do more. You must light the lamps and say some prayers by his bed. Why? that you may not be taken prisoner as his murderer. I, a murderer? It was he who tried to murder me. Mon Dieu, yes. And as he could not succeed, his rage made him break a blood vessel. But till your innocence is established, they might annoy you much. I fear you are right. Then do what I tell you. Install yourself here and recite all the prayers you know or do not know. Then, when evening comes, go out and call at the ironmonger's at the corner of the street. There you will find your horse. Mount him and take the road to Paris. At villeneuve le roi sell him, and take Panurga back. Ah, that good Panurga! I shall be delighted to see him again. But how am I to live? Chicot drew from his pocket a handful of crowns and put them into the large hand of the monk. Generous man! cried Gorenflot. Let me stay with you at Lyon. I love Lyon. But I do not stay here. I set off at once, and travel too rapidly for you to follow me. So be it, then. She co-installed the monk by the bed and went downstairs to the host. Monsieur Bunier, said he, a great event has taken place in your house. What do you mean? The hateful royalist, the enemy of our religion upstairs, received today a messenger from Rome. I know that. It was I who told you. Well, our holy father, the Pope, had sent him to this conspirator, who, however, probably did not suspect for what purpose. And why did he come? Go upstairs, lift up the bedclothes, look at his neck, and you will see. You frighten me. I say no more. The Pope did you honor in choosing your house for the scene of his vengeance. Then Chicot put ten crowns into the hand of the host, and went down to the stable to get out the horses. Monsieur Bernouillet went up and found Gorenflot praying. He looked as directed and found the wound. "'May every enemy of our religion die thus,' said he to Gorenflot. "'Amen,' replied the monk. These events passed about the same time that Bussy brought the Baron de Maridor back to his daughter. End of chapter 32 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 33 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 33. 
How the Duc d'Anjou learned that Diana was not dead. The month of April had arrived. The great cathedral of Chartres was hung with white, and the king was standing barefooted in the nave. The religious ceremonies, which were for the purpose of praying for an heir to the throne of France, were just finishing, when Henry, in the midst of the general silence, heard what seemed to him a stifled laugh. He turned round to see if Chicot were there, for he thought no one else would have dared to laugh at such a time. It was not, however, Chicot, who had laughed at the sight of the two chemises of the Holy Virgin, which were said to have a prolific power, and which were just being drawn from their golden box. But it was a cavalier who had just stopped at the door of the church, and who was making his way with his muddy boots through the crowd of courtiers in their penitents' robes and sacks. Seeing the king turn, he stopped for a moment, and Henry, irritated at seeing him arrive thus, threw an angry glance at him. The newcomer, however, continued to advance until he reached the velvet chair of Monsieur le Duc d'Anjou, by which he knelt down. He, turning round, said, Bussy. "'Good morning, Monseigneur.' "'Are you mad?' "'Why so?' "'To come here to see this nonsense?' "'Monseigneur, I wish to speak to you at once. "'Where have you been for the last three weeks?' "'That is just what I have to tell you.' "'Well, you must wait until we leave the church.' "'So much the worse. "'A patience, here is the end.' Indeed, the king was putting on one of these chemises and the queen another. Then they all knelt down, and afterwards the king, taking off his holy tunic, left the church. "'Now, Monseigneur,' said Bussy, "'shall we go to your house?' "'Yes, at once, if you have anything to tell me.' "'Plenty of things which you do not expect.' When they were in the hotel, the duke said, "'Now sit down and tell me all. I feared you were dead.' "'Very likely, Monseigneur.' You left me to look after my beautiful unknown. Who is this woman, and what am I to expect? You will reap what you've sown, Monseigneur. Plenty of shame. What do you mean? cried the Duke. What I said. Explain yourself, Monsieur. Who is this woman? I thought you had recognized her. Then it was her? Yes, Monseigneur. You saw her? Yes. And she spoke to you? Certainly. Doubtless you had reason to think her dead, and you perhaps hoped she was so. The duke grew pale. Yes, Monseigneur, continued Bussy, although you pushed to despair a young girl of noble race, she escaped from death. But do not breathe yet. Do not think yourself absolved, for in preserving her life she found a misfortune worse than death. What is it? What has happened to her? Monseigneur, a man preserved her honor and saved her life, but he made her pay for this service so dearly that she regrets his having rendered it. Finish. Well, Monseigneur, Mademoiselle de Meridor, to escape becoming the mistress of the Duc d'Anjou, has thrown herself into the arms of a man whom she detests, and is now Madame de Montsoreau. At these words the blood rushed furiously into the Duke's face. Is this true? said he. Pardieu, I said it, said Bussy haughtily. I did not mean that. I do not doubt your word, Bussy. I wondered only if it were possible that one of my gentlemen had had the audacity to interfere between me and a woman whom I honored with my love. And why not? Then you would have done so? I would have done better. I would have warned you that your honor was being lost. Listen, Bussy, said the prince, becoming calmer. I do not justify myself, but Monsieur de Montsoreau has been a traitor towards me. Towards you? Yes, he knew my intentions. And they were? To try and make Diana love me. Love you? Yes, but in no case to use violence. Those were your intentions? said Bussy with an ironical smile. Certainly, and these intentions I preserved to the last, although Monsieur de Montsoreau constantly combated them. Monseigneur, what do you say? This man incited you to dishonor Diana? Yes. By his counsels? By his letters. Would you like to see them? Oh, if I could believe that. 
you shall see and the duke opening a little cabinet and taking out a letter said since you doubt your prince's words read bussy took it and read monseigneur be quite easy the coupe de man can be executed without risk for the young person sets off this evening to pass a week with an aunt who lives at the chateau of lude i charge myself with it and you need take no trouble as for the scruples of the young lady be sure that they will vanish in the presence of your highness meanwhile i act and this evening she will be at the chateau of Beaugé. your highness's respectful servant brian de montsoreau well what do you say bussy i say that you are well served monseigneur you mean betrayed ah true i forgot the end the wretch he made me believe in the death woman whom he stole from you it is black enough how did he manage he made the father believe you the ravisher and offered himself to rescue the lady presented himself at the chateau of Beaugé with a letter from the baron de Maridor, brought a boat to the windows and carried away the prisoner then shut her up in the house you know of and by constantly working upon her fears forced her to become his wife is it not infamous only partly excused by your conduct monseigneur ah bussy you shall see how i will revenge myself princes do not revenge themselves they punish said bussy how can i punish him by restoring happiness to madame de montsoreau but can i certainly how by restoring her to liberty the marriage was forced therefore it is null you are right get it set aside then and you will have acted like a gentleman and a prince ah <laughs> said the prince what warmth you are interested in it bussy i not at all except that i do not wish people to say that louis de clermont serves a perfidious prince and a man without honor well uh, you shall see but how to do it nothing more easy make her father act but he is buried in anjou monseigneur he is here in paris at your house no with his daughter speak to him monseigneur that he may see in you not what he does now an enemy but a protector that he who now curses your name may bless you and when can i see him as soon as you return to paris very well it is agreed then yes on your word as a gentleman on my faith as a prince and when do you return this evening will you accompany me no i go first where shall i meet your highness tomorrow at the king's levee i will be there monseigneur bussy did not lose a moment and the distance that took the duke fifteen hours to accomplish sleeping in his litter the young man who returned to paris his heart beating with joy and love did in five to console the baron and diana the sooner End of chapter 33, recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 34 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 34, How Chicot Returned to the Louvre and Was Received by the King Henry III. All was quiet at the Louvre, for the king, fatigued with his pilgrimage, had not yet risen, when two men presented themselves together at the gates. "'Monsieur Chicot!' cried the younger. "'How are you this morning?' "'Ah, Monsieur de Bussy!' "'You come for the king's levee, monsieur?' "'And you also, I presume?' "'No, I come to see Monsieur le Duc d'Anjou. You know I have not the honor of being a favorite of his majesty's.' "'The reproach is for the king, and not for you.' do you come from far i heard you were traveling yes i was hunting and you yes i have been in the provinces and now you will be good enough to render me a service i shall be delighted well you can penetrate into the louvre while i remain in the antechamber will you tell the duke i am waiting for him 
Why not come with me? The king would not be pleased. Bah! Diable, he has not accustomed me to his most gracious smiles. Henceforth, for some time, all that will change. Ha! <laughs> ha! Are you a necromancer, Monsieur Chicot? Sometimes. Come, take courage and come in with me. They entered together. One went toward the apartments of the Duc d'Anjou, and the other to those of the king. Henry was just awake and had rung, and a crowd of valets and friends had rushed in. Already the chicken broth and the spiced wine were served when Chicot entered, and without saying a word sat down to eat and drink. Par la mordieu, cried the king, delighted, although he affected anger. It is that knave of a Chicot, that fugitive, that vagabond. What is the matter, my son? said Chicot, placing himself on the immense seat, embroidered with fleur-de-lis on which the king was seated. "'Here is my misfortune returned,' said Henry. "'For three weeks I have been so tranquil.' "'Bah! You always grumble. One would think you were one of your own subjects. Let me hear, Henriquette, how you have governed this kingdom in my absence.' "'Chicot! Have you hung any of your curled gentlemen? Ah! Pardon, Monsieur Quellus, I did not see you.' Chicot, I shall be angry, <laughs> said the king, but he ended by laughing as he always did. So he went on. But what has become of you? Do you know that I have had you sought for in all the bad parts of Paris? Did you search the Louvre? Just then Monsieur de Montsoreau entered. Ah, it is you, Monsieur, said the king. When shall we hunt again? When it shall please your majesty. I hear there are plenty of wild boars at St. germain en laye the wild boar is dangerous said chicot king charles the ninth i remember was nearly killed by one and then spears are sharp also is it not so henry and do you know your chief huntsman must have met a wolf not long ago why so because he has caught the likeness it is striking monsieur de monsoreau grew pale and turning to chicot said monsieur chicot i am not used to jesters having lived little at court and I warn you that before my king I do not like to be humiliated, above all when I speak of my duties. Well, monsieur, said Chicot, we are not like you. We court people laughed heartily at that last joke. And what was that? Making you chief huntsman. Monsoreau looked daggers at Chicot. Come, come, said Henry, let us speak of something else. Yes, let us speak of the merits of Notre Dame de Chartres. Chicot, no impiety. I am pious. It is you, on the contrary. There were two chemises accustomed to be together, and you separated them. Join them together, and a miracle may happen. This allusion to the estrangement of the king and queen made everyone laugh. Monsoreau then whispered to Chicot, Pray, withdraw with me into that window. I wish to speak to you. When they were alone, he went on. Now, Monsieur Chicot, buffoon as you are, a gentleman forbids you, do you understand? Forbids you to laugh at him, and to remember that others may finish what Monsieur de Mayenne began. Ah! You wish me to become your creditor as I am his, and to give you the same place in my gratitude? It seems to me that among your creditors you forget the principal. Indeed, I have generally a good memory. Who may it be? Monsieur Nicolas David. Oh, you are wrong. He is paid. At this moment, Bussy entered. Monsieur, said he to the Count, Monsieur le Duc d'Anjou desires to speak with you. With me? With you, Monsieur. Do you accompany me? No, I go first to tell the Duke you are coming. And he rapidly disappeared. Well, said the Duke, he is coming. And he suspects nothing? Nothing, but if he did, what matter? Is he not your creature? Does he seem to you less guilty than he did yesterday? No, a hundred times more so. Has he carried off by treason a noble young girl, and married her equally treasonably? Either he must ask for the dissolution of the marriage himself, or you must do it for him. I have promised. I have your word. You have. Remember that they know and are anxiously waiting. 
She shall be free, Bussy, I pledge my word. Bussy kissed the hand which had signed so many false promises. As he did so, Monsieur de Monsoreau entered, and Bussy went to the corridor, where were several other gentlemen. Here he had to wait as patiently as might be for the result of this interview, on which all his future happiness was at stake. He waited for some time, when suddenly the door of the duke's room opened, and the sound of Monsieur de Monsoreau's voice made Bussy tremble, for it sounded almost joyful. Soon the voices approached, and Bussy could see Monsieur de Monsoreau bowing and retiring, and he heard the duke say, Adieu, my friend. My friend? murmured Bussy. Then Monsoreau said, Your highness agrees with me that publicity is best? Yes, yes, an end to all mysteries. Then this evening I will present her to the king. Do so, I will prepare him. Gentlemen, then said Monsoreau, turning towards those in the corridor, allow me to announce to you a secret. Monseigneur permits me to make public my marriage with Mademoiselle Diana de Meridor, who has been my wife for more than a month, and whom I intend this evening to present to the court. Bussy, who had been hidden behind a door, staggered and almost fell at this unexpected blow. However, he darted a glance of contempt at the duke, towards whom he made a step, but he in terror shut his door and Bussy heard the key turn in the lock. Feeling that if he stayed a moment longer he should betray before everyone the violence of his grief, he ran downstairs, got on his horse, and galloped to the Rue St. Antoine. Le Baron and Diana were eagerly waiting for him, and they saw him enter, pale and trembling. "'Madame!' cried he. "'Hate me! Despise me! I believed I could do something, and I can do nothing! Madame, you are now the recognized wife of monsieur de monsoreau and are to be presented this evening i am a fool a miserable dupe or rather as you said monsieur le baron the duke is a coward and a villain and leaving the father and daughter overcome with grief he rushed wildly away end of chapter thirty four recording by john van stan savannah georgia Chapter thirty five of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter thirty five. What passed between Monsieur de Monsoreau and the Duke. It is time to explain the Duke's sudden change of intention with regard to Monsieur de Monsoreau. When he first received him, it was with dispositions entirely favorable to Bussy's wishes. Your Highness sent for me, said Monsoreau. You have nothing to fear, you who have served me so well and are so much attached to me. Often you have told me of the plots against me, have aided my enterprises forgetting your own interests, and exposing your life. Your Highness, even lately in this last unlucky adventure. What adventure, Monseigneur? This carrying off of Mademoiselle de Meridor, poor young creature. Alas, murmured Monsoreau. "'You pity her, do you not?' said the duke. "'Does not your highness?' "'I? You know how I have regretted this fatal caprice, and indeed it required all my friendship for you, and the remembrance of all your good services, to make me forget that without you I should not have carried off this young girl.' Monsoreau felt the blow. "'Monseigneur,' said he, your natural goodness leads you to exaggerate. You no more caused the death of this young girl than I did. How so? You did not intend to use violence to Mademoiselle de Meridor? Certainly not. Then the intention absolves you. It is a misfortune. Nothing more. And besides, said the Duke, looking at him, death has buried all in eternal silence. The tone of his voice and his look struck Monsoreau. Monseigneur, said he, after a moment's pause, shall I speak frankly to you? Why should you hesitate, said the prince, with astonishment mingled with hauteur? Indeed, I do not know, but your highness has not thought fit to be frank with me. Really? <laughs> cried the duke with an angry laugh. Monseigneur, I know what your highness meant to say to me. Speak, then. Your Highness wished to make me understand that perhaps Mademoiselle de Meridor was not dead, 
and that therefore those who believe themselves her murderers might be free from remorse. Oh, monsieur, you have taken your time before making this consoling reflection to me. You're a faithful servant, on my word. You saw me sad and afflicted. You heard me speak of the wretched dreams I had since the death of this woman, and you let me live thus? When even a doubt might have spared me so much suffering, how must I consider this conduct, monsieur? Monseigneur, is your highness accusing me? Traitor! cried the duke. You have deceived me. You have taken from me this woman whom I loved. Monsoreau turned pale, but did not lose his proud, calm look. It is true, said he. True, knave! Please, to speak lower, Monseigneur, your highness forgets that you speak to a gentleman and an old servant. The duke laughed. My excuses, continued he, that I loved Mademoiselle de Meridor ardently. I also, replied Francois with dignity. It is true, Monseigneur, but did she not love you? And she loved you? Perhaps. You lie, you know you lie. You used force as I did. Not only I, the master, failed, while you, the servant, succeeded by treason. Monseigneur, I loved her. What do I care? Monseigneur, take care. I loved her. I am not a servant. My wife is mine, and no one can take her from me, not even the king. I wished to have her, and I took her. You took her? Well, you shall give her up. You are wrong, Monseigneur, and do not call, continued he, stopping him, for if you call once, if you do me a public injury, you shall give up this woman. Give her up? She is my wife before God. If she is your wife before God, you shall give her up before men. I know all, and I will break this marriage, I tell you. Tomorrow, Mademoiselle de Maridor shall be restored to her father. You shall set off into exile, I impose on you. You shall have sold your place. These are my conditions, and take care, or I will break you as I break this glass. And he threw down violently a crystal cup. I will not give up my wife. I will not give up my place, and I will remain in France, replied Monsoreau. You will not? No. I will ask my pardon of the King of France, of the King anointed at the Abbey of St. Genevieve, and this new sovereign will not, I am sure, refuse the first request proffered to him. Francois grew deadly pale and nearly fell. Well, 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 stammered he. This request, speak lower. I listen. I will speak humbly as becomes a servant of your highness. A fatal love was the cause of all. Love is the most imperious of the passions. To make me forget that your highness had cast your eyes on Diana, I must have been no longer master of myself. It was treason. Do not overwhelm me, Monseigneur. I saw you rich, young, and happy, the first Christian prince in the world. For you are so, and between you and supreme rank there is now only a shadow easy to dispel. I saw all the splendor of your future, and comparing your proud position with my humble one, I said, Leave to the prince his brilliant prospects and splendid projects. Scarcely will he miss the pearl that I steal from his royal crown. Compte! Compte! You pardon me, Monseigneur, do you not? At this moment the duke raised his eyes and saw Bussy's portrait on the wall. It seemed to exhort him to courage, and he said, No, I cannot pardon you. It is not for myself that I hold out. It is because a father in mourning, a father unworthily deceived, cries out for his daughter. Because a woman, forced to marry you, cries for vengeance against you. Because, in a word, the first duty of a prince is justice. Monseigneur, if justice be a duty, gratitude is not less so, and a king should never forget those to whom he owes his crown. Now, Monseigneur, you owe your crown to me. Monsoreau, cried the duke in terror, but I cling to those only who cling to me. I cannot. You are a gentleman. You know I cannot approve of what you have done. My dear count, this one more sacrifice. I will recompense you for it. I will give you all you ask. 
then your highness loves her still cried montsoreau pale with jealousy no i swear i do not then why should i i am a gentleman who can enter into the secrets of my private life but she does not love you what matter do this for me montsoreau i cannot then commenced the duke who was terribly perplexed reflect sire you will denounce me to the king dethroned for you yes for if my new king destroyed my honor and happiness i would return to the old it is infamous true sire but i love enough to be infamous it is cowardly yes your majesty but i love enough to be cowardly come monseigneur do something for the man who has served you so well what do you want that you should pardon me i will that you should reconcile me with monsieur de meridor i will try that you will sign my marriage contract with mademoiselle de meridor yes said the prince in a hoarse voice and that you shall honor my wife with a smile when i shall present her to your majesty yes is that all all monseigneur you have my word and you shall keep the throne to which i have raised you it remains now only thought monsoreau to find out who told the duke end of chapter thirty five recording by john van stan savannah georgia Chapter thirty six of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter thirty six Chicot and the King. That same evening, Monsieur de Maranceau presented his wife in the Queen's circle. Henry, tired, had gone to bed, but after sleeping three or four hours, he woke, and feeling no longer sleepy, proceeded to the room where Chicot slept, which was the one formerly occupied by Saint Luc. Chicot slept soundly, and the king called him three times before he woke. At last he opened his eyes and cried out, "'What is it?' "'Chicot, my friend, it is I.' "'You who?' "'I, Henry.' "'Decidedly, my son, the pheasants must have disagreed with you. I warned you at supper, but you would eat so much of them, as well as those crabs.' "'No, I scarcely tasted them.' then you are poisoned perhaps ventre de biche how pale you are it is my mask said the king then you are not ill no then why wake me because i am annoyed annoyed if you wake a man at two o'clock in the morning at least you should bring him a present have you anything for me no i come to talk to you that is enough Chicot, Monsieur de Morvilliers came here last evening. What for? To ask for an audience. What can he want to say to me, Chicot? What? It is only to ask that that you wake me. Chicot, you know he occupies himself with the police. No, I did not know it. Do you doubt his watchfulness? Yes, I do, and I have my reasons what are they will one suffice you yes if it be good and you will leave me in peace afterwards certainly well one day no it was one evening i beat you in the rue foidmantel you had with you quellus and schomberg you beat me yes all three of you how it was you wretch i myself said chicot rubbing his hands do i not hit hard wretch you confess it was true you know it is villain did you send for monsieur de morvilliers the next day you know i did for you were there when he came and you told him the accident that had happened to one of your friends yes and you ordered him to find out the criminal yes did he find him 
No. Well, then, go to bed, Henry. You see your police is bad. And turning round, Chicot refused to say another word and was soon snoring again. The next day, the council assembled. It consisted of Quellus, Maugiron, Depernon, and Schomberg. Chicot, seated at the head of the table, was making paper boats and arranging them in a fleet. Monsieur de Morvilliers was announced and came in looking grave. "'Am I,' said he, "'before your majesty's council?' "'Yes, before my best friends. Speak freely.' "'Well, sire, I have a terrible plot to denounce to your majesty.' "'A plot?' cried all. "'Yes, your majesty.' "'Oh, is it a Spanish plot?' At this moment the Duc d'Anjou, who had been summoned to attend the council, entered. "'My brother,' said Henry, "'Monsieur de Morvilliers comes to announce a plot to us.' The duke threw a suspicious glance round him. "'Is it possible?' he said. "'Alas, yes, Monseigneur,' said Monsieur de Morvilliers. "'Tell us about it,' said Chicot. "'Yes,' stammered the duke. "'Tell us all about it, Monsieur.' "'I listen,' said Henry. "'Sire, for some time I have been watching some malcontents, but they were shopkeepers or junior clerks, a few monks and students.' "'That is not much,' said Chicot. "'I know that malcontents always make use either of war or of religion.' "'Very sensible,' said the king. "'I put my men on the watch.' and at last I succeeded in persuading a man from the provosty of Paris to watch the preachers, who go about exciting the people against your majesty. They are prompted by a party hostile to your majesty, and this party I have studied, and now I know their hopes," added he triumphantly. I have men in my pay, greedy, it is true, who, for a good sum of money, promise to let me know of the first meeting of the conspirators. Oh, never mind money, but let us hear the aim of this conspiracy. Sire, they think of nothing less than a second Saint Bartholomew. Against whom? Against the Huguenots. What have you paid for your secret? said Chicot. One hundred and sixty thousand livers. Chicot turned to the king, saying, If you like, for one thousand crowns, I will tell you all the secrets of Monsieur de Morvilliers speak it is simply the league instituted ten years ago monsieur de morvilliers has discovered what every parisian knows as well as his ave monseigneur interrupted the chancellor i speak the truth and i will prove it cried chicot tell me then their meeting place firstly the public streets secondly the public streets Monsieur Chicot is joking, said the Chancellor. Tell me their rallying sign. They are dressed like Parisians and shake their legs when they walk. A burst of laughter followed the speech. Then Monsieur de Morvilliers said, They have had one meeting place which Monsieur Chicot does not know of. Where? asked the king. The Abbey of St. Genevieve. Impossible, murmured the Duke. It is true, said Monsieur de Morvilliers, triumphantly. What did they decide? asked the king. That the leaguers should choose chiefs, that everyone should arm, that every province should receive a deputy from the conspirators, and that all the Huguenots cherished by his majesty, that was their expression, the king smiled, should be massacred on a given day. Is that all? said the duke. No, Monseigneur. I should hope not, said Chicot. If the king got only that for one hundred and sixty thousand liver, it would be a shame. There are chiefs. The Duc d'Anjou could not repress a start. What? cried Chicot. A conspiracy that has chiefs? How wonderful! But we ought to have more than that for one hundred and sixty thousand liver. Their names, asked the king. Firstly, a fanatic preacher i gave ten thousand liver for his name very well a monk called gorenflot poor devil said chicot gorenflot said the king writing down the name afterwards oh said the chancellor with hesitation 
that is all and he looked round as if to say if your majesty were alone you should hear more speak chancellor said the king i have none but friends here oh sire i hesitate to pronounce such powerful names are they more powerful than i am cried the king no sire but one does not tell secrets in public monsieur said the duc d'anjou we will retire the king signed to the chancellor to approach him and the duke to remain monsieur de morvilliers had just bent over the king to whisper his communication when a great clamor was heard in the court of the louvre the king jumped up but chicot running to the window called out it is monsieur de guise entering the louvre the duc de guise stammered the duc d'anjou how strange that he should be in paris said the king reading the truth in monsieur de morvilliers look was it of him you were about to speak he asked yes sire he presided over the meeting and the others i know no more you need not write that name on your tablets you will not forget it whispered chicot the duc de guise advanced smiling to see the king end of chapter thirty six recording by john van stan savannah georgia chapter thirty seven of chicot the jester by alexander dumas this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 37. What Monsieur de Guise came to do at the Louvre. Behind Monsieur de Guise there entered a great number of officers, courtiers, and gentlemen, and behind them a concourse of the people, an escort less brilliant but more formidable, and it was their cries that had resounded as the Duke entered the Louvre. "'Ah, it is you, my cousin,' said the King. "'What a noise you bring with you! Did I not hear the trumpets sound?' sire the trumpets sounded paris only for the king and in campaigns for the general here the trumpets would make too much noise for a subject there they do not make enough for a prince henry bit his lips have you arrived from the siege of la charite only to-day only to-day sire replied the duke with a heightened color ma foi your visit is a great honor to us your majesty jests no doubt how can my visit honor him from whom all honor comes i mean monsieur de guise replied henry that every good catholic is in the habit on returning from a campaign to visit god first in one of his temples the king only comes second honor god serve the king you know my cousin the heightened color of the duke became now still more distinct and the king happening to turn toward his brother saw with astonishment that he was as pale as the duke was red he was struck by this emotion in each, but he said, At all events, Duke, nothing equals my joy to see that you have escaped all the dangers of war, although you sought them, I was told, in the rashest manner. But danger knows you and flies from you. The Duke bowed. But I must beg you, my cousin, not to be so ambitious of mortal perils, for you put to shame sluggards like us, who sleep, eat, and invent new prayers yes sire replied the duke we know you to be a pious prince and that no pleasure can make you forget the glory of god and the interests of the church that is why we have come with so much confidence to your majesty with confidence do you not always come to me with confidence my cousin sire the confidence of which i speak refers to the proposition i am about to make to you you have a proposition to make me well speak as you say with confidence what have you to propose the execution of one of the most beautiful ideas which has been originated since the crusades continue duke sire the title of the most christian king is not a vain one it makes an ardent zeal for religion incumbent on its possessor is the church menaced by the saracens once more sire the great concourse of people who followed me blessing my name honored me with this reception only because of my zeal to defend the church i have already had the honor of speaking to your majesty of an alliance between all true catholics yes yes said chicot the league ventre de biche henry the league by saint bartholomew how can you forget so splendid an idea my son the duke cast a disdainful glance on chicot 
while d'anjou who stood by as pale as death tried by signs to make the duke stop look at your brother henry whispered chicot sire continued the duke de guise the catholics have indeed called this association the holy league and its aim is to fortify the throne against the huguenots its mortal enemies but to form an association is not enough and in a kingdom like france several millions of men cannot assemble without the consent of the king several millions cried henry almost with terror several millions repeated chicot a small number of malcontents which may bring forth pretty results sire cried the duke i am astonished that your majesty allows me to be interrupted so often when i am speaking on serious matters quite right said chicot silence there several millions repeated the king and against these millions how many huguenots are there in my kingdom four said chicot this new sally made the king and his friends laugh but the duke frowned and his gentlemen murmured loudly henry becoming once more serious said uh, well duke what do you wish to the point i wish sire for your popularity is dearer to me than my own that your majesty should be superior to us in your zeal for religion i wish you to choose a chief for the league well said the king to those who surrounded him what do you think of it my friends chicot without saying a word drew out a lion's skin from a corner and threw himself on it what are you doing chicot asked the king sire they say that night brings good counsel that must be because of sleep therefore i am going to sleep and to-morrow i will reply to my cousin guise the duke cast a furious glance on chicot who replied by a loud snore well sire said the duke what does your majesty say i think that as usual you are in the right my cousin convoke then your principal leaguers come at their head and i will choose the chief when sire to-morrow the duc de guise then took leave and the duc d'anjou was about to do the same when the king said stay my brother i wish to speak to you end of chapter thirty seven recording by john van stan savannah georgia Chapter thirty eight of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter thirty eight Castor and Pollux. The king dismissed all his favorites and remained with his brother. The duke, who had managed to preserve a tolerably composed countenance throughout, believed himself unsuspected and remained without fear. My brother, said Henry, after assuring himself that with the exception of chicot no one remained in the room do you know that i am a very happy prince sire if your majesty be really happy it is a recompense from heaven for your merits yes happy continued the king for if great ideas do not come to me they do to my subjects it is a great idea which has occurred to my cousin guise the duke made a sign of assent and chicot opened his eyes to watch the king's face indeed continued henry to unite under one banner all the catholics to arm all france on this pretext from calais to languedoc from britannia to burgundy so that i shall always have an army ready to march against england holland or spain without alarming any of them do you know francois it is a magnificent idea is it not sire said the duke delighted yes i confess i feel tempted to reward largely the author of this fine project chicot opened his eyes but he shut them again for he had seen on the face of the king one of his almost imperceptible smiles and he was satisfied yes continued henry i repeat such a project merits recompense and i will do what i can for the author of this good work for the work is begun is it not my brother the duke confessed that it was better and better my subjects not only conceive these good ideas but in their anxiety to be of use to me hasten to put them in execution but i ask you my dear francois if it be really to the duc de guise that i am indebted for this royal thought 
No, sire, it occurred to the Cardinal de Lorraine twenty years ago. Only the Saint Bartholomew rendered it needless for the time. Ah, what a pity he is dead! But, continued Henry, with that air of frankness which made him the first comedian of the day, his nephew has inherited it and brought it to bear. What can I do for him? Sire, said Francois, completely duped by his brother, you exaggerate his merits. He has, as I say, but inherited the idea, and another man has given him great help in developing it. His brother, the cardinal? Doubtless he has been occupied with it, but I do not mean him. Mayenna, then? Oh, sire, you do him too much honor. True. How could any good ideas come to such a butcher? But to whom, then, am I to be grateful for aid to my cousin Guise? To me, sire. To you? cried Henry, as if in astonishment. How? When I saw all the world unchained against me, the preachers against my vices, the poets against my weaknesses, while my friends laughed at my powerlessness, and my situation was so harassing that it gave me gray hairs every day. Such an idea came to you, Francois, to you whom I confess, for a man is feeble and kings are blind, I did not always believe to be my friend. Ah, Francois, how guilty I have been! And Henry, moved even to tears, held out his hand to his brother. Chico opened his eyes again. Oh, continued Henry, the idea is triumphant. Not being able to raise troops without raising an outcry, scarcely to walk, sleep, or love, without exciting ridicule, this idea gives me at once an army, money, friends, and repose. But my cousin spake of a chief? Yes, doubtless. This chief, you understand, Francois, cannot be one of my favorites. None of them has at once the head and the heart necessary for so important a post. Quellus is brave, but is occupied only by his amours. Maugiron is also brave, but he thinks only of his toilet. Schomberg also, but he is not clever. D'Epernon is a valiant man, but he is a hypocrite, whom I, I could not trust, although I am friendly to him. But you know, Francois, that one of the heaviest taxes on a king is the necessity of dissimulation. Therefore, when I can speak freely from the heart as I do now, I breathe. Well, then, if my cousin Guise originated this idea, to the development of which you have assisted, the execution of it belongs to him. What do you say, sire? said Francois uneasily. I say that to direct such a movement we must have a prince of high rank. Sire, take care. A good captain and a skillful negotiator. The last, particularly. Well, is not Monsieur de Guise all this? My brother, he is very powerful already. Yes, doubtless, but his power makes my strength. He holds already the army and the bourgeois. The cardinal holds the church, and Mayenna is their instrument. It is a great deal of power to be concentrated in one family. It is true, Francois. I had thought of that. If the Guises were French princes, their interests would be to aggrandize France. Yes, but they are Lorraines. Of a house always rival to yours. Yes, Francois, you have touched the sore. I did not think you so good a politician. Yes, there does not pass a day, but one or other of these Guises, either by address or by force, carries away from me some particle of my power. <laughs> Francois, if we had but had this explanation sooner, if I had been able to read your heart as I do now, certain of supporting you, I might have resisted better, but now it is too late. Why so? Because all combats fatigue me. Therefore I must make him chief of the League. You will be wrong, brother. But who could I name, Francois? Who would accept this perilous post? Yes, perilous. For do you not see that he intended me to appoint him chief, and that, should I name anyone else to the post, he would treat him as an enemy? Name someone so powerful that, supported by you, he need not fear all the three Lorraine princes together. Ah, my good brother, 
I know no such person. Look round you, brother. I know no one but you and Chico, who are really my friends. Well, brother. Henry looked at the duke as if a veil had fallen from his eyes. Surely you would never consent, brother. It is not you who could teach all these bourgeois their exercise, who could look over the discourses of the preachers, who, in case of battle, would play the butcher in the streets of Paris. For all this one must be triple, like the duke, and have a right arm called Charles, and a left called Louis. What? You would like all this? You, the first gentleman of our court? More de ma vie! How people change with age! Perhaps I would not do it for myself, brother, but I would do it for you. Excellent brother, said Henry, wiping away a tear which never existed. Then, said the duke, it would not displease you for me to assume this post. Displease me, on the contrary, would charm me. Francois trembled with joy. Oh, if your majesty thinks me worthy of this confidence. Confidence? When you are the chief, what have I to fear? The League itself? That cannot be dangerous, can it, Francois? Oh, sire? No, for then you would not be chief, or at least, when you are chief, there will be no danger. But, Francois, the duke is doubtless certain of this appointment, and he will not lightly give away. Sire, you grant me the command? Certainly. And you wish me to have it? Particularly, but I dare not too much displease Monsieur de Guise. Oh, make yourself easy, sire. If that be the only obstacle, I pledge myself to arrange it. When? At once. Are you going to him? That will be doing him too much honor. No, sire, he is waiting for me. Where? In my room. Your room? I heard the cries of the people as he left the Louvre. Yes, but after going out at the great door, he came back by the postern. The king had the right to the first visit, but I to the second. Ah, oh, brother, I thank you for keeping up our prerogative, which I had the weakness so often to abandon. Go then, Francois, and do your best. Francois bent down to kiss the king's hand, but he, opening his arms, gave him a warm embrace and then the duke left the room to go to his interview with the duc de guise the king seeing his brother gone gave an angry growl and rapidly made his way through the secret corridor until he reached a hiding place whence he could distinctly hear the conversation between the two dukes ventre de biche cried chicot starting up how touching these family scenes are for an instant i believed myself in olympus assisting at the reunion of castor and pollux after six months separation End of chapter 38. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 39 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 39. In which it is proved that listening is the best way to hear. The Duc d'Anjou was well aware that there were few rooms in the Louvre which were not built so that what was said in them could be heard from the outside, but, completely seduced by his brother's manner, he forgot to take any precautions. "'Why, Monseigneur,' said the Duc de Guise, "'how pale you are!' "'Visibly?' "'Yes, to me.' "'The King saw nothing.' "'I think not, but he retained you.' "'Yes.' And what did he say, Monseigneur? He approves the idea, but the more gigantic it appears, the more he hesitates to place a man like you at the head. Then we are likely to fail. I fear so, my dear Duke. The League seems likely to fail. Before it begins. At this moment, Henry, hearing a noise, turned and saw Chicot by his side, listening also. You followed me, knave said he. Hush, my son, said Chicot, you prevent me from hearing. Monseigneur, said the Duc de Guise, it seems to me that in this case the king would have refused at once. Does he wish to dispossess me? 
I believe so. Then he would ruin the enterprise. Yes, but I aided you with all my power. How, Monseigneur? In this, the king has left me almost master, to kill or reanimate the league. How so? cried the duke with sparkling eyes. Why, if, instead of dissolving the league, he named me chief? Ah! cried the duke, while the blood mounted to his face. Hmm, the dogs are going to fight over their bones, said Chicot. But to his surprise and the king's, the duc de Guise suddenly became calm and exclaimed in an almost joyful tone, You are an adroit politician, Monseigneur, if you did this. Yes, I did, but I would not conclude anything without speaking to you. Why so, Monseigneur? Because I did not know what it would lead us to. Well, I will tell you, Monseigneur, not to what it will lead us, that God alone knows, but how it will serve us. The League is a second army, and as I hold the first, and my brother the Church, nothing can resist us as long as we are united. Without counting, said the Duc d'Anjou, that I am heir presumptive to the throne. True, but still calculate your bad chances. I have done so a hundred times. There is first the King of Nevada. Oh, I do not mind him. He is entirely occupied by his amours with La Fossus. He, Monseigneur, will dispute every inch with you. He watches you and your brother. He hungers for the throne. If any accident should happen to your brother, see if he will not be here with a bound from Pau to Paris. An accident to my brother? repeated Francois. Listen, Henry, said Chicot. Yes, Monseigneur, said the Duc de Guise, in accident. Accidents are not rare in your family. You know that as well as I do. One prince is in good health, and all at once he falls ill of a lingering malady. Another is counting on long years, when perhaps he has but a few hours to live. Do you hear, Henry? said Chicot, taking the hand of the king, who shuddered at what he had heard. Yes, it is true, said the Duc d'Anjou. The princes of my house are born under fatal influences, but my brother Henry is, thank God, strong and well. He supported formerly the fatigues of war, and now that his life is nothing but recreation. Yes, but, Monseigneur, remember one thing. These recreations are not always without danger. How did your father, Henry the Second, die, for example? He, who also had happily escaped the dangers of war, the wound by Monsieur de Montgomery's lance was an accident. Then your poor brother, Francois. One would hardly call a pain in the ears an accident, and yet it was one. At least I have often heard it said that this mortal malady was poured into his ear by someone well known. Duke, murmured Francois, reddening. Yes, Monseigneur, the name of King has long brought misfortune with it. Look at Antoine de Bourbon, who died from a spot in the shoulder. Then there was Jeanne d'Albray, the mother of the Bearnais, who died from smelling a pair of perfumed gloves, an accident very unexpected, although there were people who had great interest in this death. Then Charles the Ninth, who died neither by the eye, nor ear, nor the shoulder, but by the mouth. What did you say? cried Francois, starting back. Yes, Monseigneur, by the mouth. Those hunting books are very dangerous, of which the pages stick together, and can only be opened by wetting the finger constantly. Duke, Duke, I believe you invent crimes. Crimes? Who speaks of crimes? I speak of accidents. Was it not also an accident that happened to Charles the Ninth at the chase? You know what chase I mean, that of the boar, where, intending to kill the wild boar which had turned on your brother, you, who never before had missed your aim, did so then, and the king would have been killed, as he had fallen from his horse, had not Henry of Nevada slain the animal which you had missed. But, said the Duc d'Anjou, trying to recover himself, what interest could I have had in the death of Charles the Ninth, when the next king would be Henry the Third? Oh, Monseigneur, there was already one throne vacant, that of Poland. The death of Charles the Ninth would have left another, that of France and even the kingdom of Poland might not have been despised. 
Besides, the death of Charles would have brought you a degree nearer the throne, and the next accident would have benefited you. What do you conclude from all this, Duke? said the Duc d'Anjou. Monseigneur, I conclude that each king has his accident, and that you are the inevitable accident of Henry the Third, particularly if you are chief of the League. Then I am to accept? Oh, I beg you to do so. And you? Oh, be easy. My men are ready, and tonight Paris will be curious. What are they going to do in Paris tonight? asked Henry. Oh, how foolish you are, my friend. Tonight they signed the League publicly. It is well, said the Duc d'Anjou. Till this evening, then? Yes, till this evening, said Henry. How, said Chicot, you will not risk going into the streets tonight. Yes, I shall. You are wrong, Henry. Remember the accidents. Oh, I shall be well accompanied. Will you come with me? What? Do you take me for a Huguenot? I shall go and sign the League ten times. However, Henry, you have a great advantage over your predecessors in being warned, for you know now your brother, do you not? Yes, and mordieu, before long he shall find it out. End of chapter 39 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter Forty of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter Forty, The Evening of the League. Paris presented a fine sight, as through its then narrow streets thousands of people pressed toward the same point. For at eight o'clock in the evening, Monsieur le Duc de Guise was to receive the signatures of the bourgeois to the League. A crowd of citizens dressed in their best clothes, as for a fete but fully armed, directed their steps toward the churches. What added to the noise and confusion was that large numbers of women, disdaining to stay at home on such a great day, had followed their husbands, and many had brought with them a whole batch of children. It was in the Rue de la Brissac that the crowd was the thickest. The streets were literally choked, and the crowd pressed tumultuously towards a bright light suspended below the sign of the Belle Etoile. On the threshold a man with a cotton cap on his head and a naked sword in one hand and a register in the other was crying out, Come, come, brave Catholics, enter the hotel of the Belle Etoile, where you will find good wine. Come, tonight the good will be separated from the bad, and tomorrow morning the wheat will be known from the tares. Come, gentlemen, you who can write, come and sign. You who cannot write, come and tell your names to me. La Hurriera, vive la Messe. A tall man elbowed his way through the crowd, and in letters half an inch high wrote his name, Chicot. Then, turning to La Herriera, he asked if he had not another register to sign. La Herriera did not understand raillery, and answered angrily. Chicot retorted, and a quarrel seemed approaching, when Chicot, feeling someone touch his arm, turned, and saw the king disguised as a simple bourgeois, and accompanied by Quellus and Maugiron, also disguised and carrying an arquebus on their shoulders. What? cried the king. Good Catholics disputing among themselves. Par la mordieu, it is a bad example. Do not mix yourself with what does not concern you, replied Chicot without seeming to recognize him. But a new influx of the crowd distracted the attention of La Hodiera, and separated the king and his companions from the hotel. Why are you here, sire? said Chicot. Do you think I have anything to fear? Eh, mon Dieu! In a crowd like this, it is so easy for one man to put a knife into his neighbor, and who just utters an oath and gives up the ghost? Have I been seen? I think not, but you will be if you stay longer. Go back to the Louvre, sire. Oh, oh, what is this new outcry, and what are the people running for? Chicot looked, but could at first see nothing but a mass of people crying, howling, and pushing. At last the mass opened, and a monk, mounted on a donkey, appeared. The monk spoke and gesticulated, and the ass brayed. Ventre de biche!' cried Chicot. "'Listen to the preacher!' "'A preacher on a donkey!' cried Quellus. "'Why not?' "'He is Selenus, said Maugiron. "'Which is the preacher?' said the king. 
for they speak both at once. The underneath one is the most eloquent, said Chicot, but the one at the top speaks the best French. Listen, Henry. My brethren, said the monk, Paris is a superb city. Paris is the pride of France, and the Parisians a fine people. Then he began to sing, but the ass mingled his accompaniment so loudly that he was obliged to stop. The crowd burst out laughing. Hold your tongue, Panurga, hold your tongue, cried the monk. You shall speak after, but let me speak first. The ass was quiet. My brothers, continued the preacher, the earth is a valley of grief where man often can quench his thirst only with his tears. He is drunk, said the king. I should think so. I who speak to you, continued the monk, I am returning from exile, like the Hebrews of old, and for eight days Panurga and I have been living on alms and privations. Who is Panurga? asked the king. The superior of his convent, probably, but let me listen. Who made me endure this? It was Herod. You know what Herod I speak of. I and Panurga have come from the villeneuve le roi in three days to assist at this great solemnity. Now we see, but do we not understand? What is passing, my brothers? Is it today that they depose Herod? Is it today that they put Brother Henry in a convent? Gentlemen, continued he, I left Paris with two friends, Panurga, who is my ass, and Chicot, who is his majesty's jester. Can you tell me what has become of my friend Chicot? Chicot made a grimace. Oh, said the king, he is your friend. Quellus and Maugiron burst out laughing. He is handsome and respectable, continued the king. It is Gorenflot of whom Monsieur de Morvilliers spoke to you. The incendiary of St. Genevieve? Himself? Then I will have him hanged. Impossible. Why? He has no neck. My brothers, continued Gorenflot, I am a true martyr, and it is my cause that they defend at this moment, or rather that of all good Catholics. You do not know what is passing in the provinces. We have been obliged at Lyon to kill a Huguenot who preached revolt. While one of them remains in France, there will be no tranquillity for us. Let us exterminate them. To arms! To arms! Several voices repeated, To arms! Parlamer, Dieu, said the king. Make this fellow hold his tongue, or he will make a second St. Bartholomew. Wait, said Chicot and with his stick he struck Gorenflot with all his force on the shoulders. "'Murder!' cried the monk. "'It is you!' cried Chicot. "'Help me, Monsieur Chicot, help me! The enemies of the faith wish to assassinate me, but I will not die without making my voice heard. Death to the Huguenots!' "'Will you hold your tongue?' cried Chicot. But at this moment a second blow fell on the shoulders of the monk with such force that he cried out with real pain. Chicot, astonished, looked round him but saw nothing but the stick. The blow had been given by a man who had immediately disappeared in the crowd after administering this punishment. Who the devil could it have been? thought Chicot, and he began to run after the man, who was gliding away, followed by only one companion. End of chapter 40 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 41 of Chicot the Jester by Alexander Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 41. The Rue de la Ferranerie. Chicot had good legs, and he would have made the best use of them to join the man who had beaten Gorenflot if he had not imagined that there might be danger in trying to recognize a man who so evidently wished to avoid it. He thought the best way not to seem to watch them was to pass them, so he ran on and passed them at the corner of the Rue Tirechappe, and then he hid himself at the end of the Rue des Bourdonnais. The two men went on, their hats slouched over their eyes and their cloaks drawn up over their faces with a quick and military step, until they reached the Rue de la Ferronnerie. There they stopped and looked round them. Chicot, who was still ahead, saw in the middle of the street, before a house so old that it looked falling to pieces, 
a litter attached to which were two horses the driver had fallen asleep while a woman apparently unquiet was looking anxiously through the blind chicot hid himself behind a large stone wall which served as stalls for the vegetable sellers on the days when the market was held in this street and watched scarcely was he hidden when he saw the two men approach the litter one of whom on seeing the driver asleep uttered an impatient exclamation while the other pushed him to awaken him oh they are compatriots thought chicot the lady now leaned out of the window and chicot saw that she was young very pale and very beautiful the two men approached the litter and the taller of the two took in both of his the little white hand which was stretched out to him well mummy asked he how are you i have been very anxious replied she why the devil did you bring madame to paris said the other man rudely ma foi it is a malediction that you must always have a petticoat tacked to your doublet ah dear agrippa replied the man who had spoken first it is so great a grief to part from one you love on my soul you make me swear to hear you talk did you come to paris to make love it seems to me that bayern is large enough for your sentimental promenades without continuing them in this babylon where you have nearly got us killed twenty times to-day go home if you wish to make love but here keep to your political intrigues my master let him scold me mamie and never mind him i think he would be ill if he did not but at least ventre saint gris as you say get into the litter and say your sweet things to madame you will run less risk of being recognized there than in the open street you are right agrippa give me a place mamie if you permit me to sit by your side permit sire i desire it ardently replied the lady sire murmured chicot who carried away by an impulse tried to raise his head and knocked it against the stone wall meanwhile the happy lover profited by the permission given and seated himself in the litter oh how happy i am he cried without attending in the least to the impatience of his friend ventre saint gris this is a good day here are my good parisians who execrate me with all their souls and would kill me if they could working to smooth my way to the throne and i have in my arms the woman i love where are we Dauvinet? when i am king i will erect here a statue to the genius of the bayonnais the bayern began chicot but he stopped for he had given his head a second bump we are in the rue de la ferronnerie sire said Dauvinet, and it does not smell nice get in then agrippa and we will go on ma foi no i will follow behind i should annoy you and what is worse you would annoy me shut the door then bear of bayern and do as you like then to the coachman he said la varenne you know where the litter went slowly away followed by daubigny let me see said chicot must i tell henry what i have seen why should i two men and a woman who hide themselves it would be cowardly i will not tell that i know it myself is the important point for is it not i who reign his love was very pretty but he loves too often this dear henry of nevada a year ago it was madame de sauve and i suppose this was la Fasuse. however i love the bernays for i believe some day he will do an ill turn to those dear guises well i have seen everyone today but the duc d'anjou he alone is wanting to my list of princes where can my francois the third be ventre de biche i must look for the worthy monarch chicot was not the only person who was seeking for the duc d'anjou and unquiet at his absence the guises had also sought for him on all sides but they were not more lucky than chicot monsieur d'anjou was not the man to risk himself imprudently and we shall see afterwards what precautions had kept him from his friends once chicot thought he had found him in the rue Bethesy. a numerous group was standing at the door of a wine merchant and in this group chicot recognized monsieur de montsoreau and monsieur de guise and fancied that the duc d'anjou could not be far off but he was wrong monsieurs de montsoreau and guise were occupied in exciting still more an orator in his stammering eloquence this orator was gorenflot recounting his journey to lyon and his duel in an inn with a dreadful huguenot monsieur de guise was listening intently for he began to fancy it had something to do with the silence of nicolas david 
Chicot was terrified. He felt sure that in another moment Gorenflot would pronounce his name, which would throw a fatal light on the mystery. Chicot, in an instant, cut the bridles of some of the horses that were fastened up, and giving each of them a violent blow, sent them galloping among the crowd, which opened and began to disperse in different directions. Chicot passed quickly through the groups, and, approaching Gorenflot, took Panurga by the bridle and turned him round. The Duc de Guise was already separated from them by the rush of the people, and Chicot led off Gorenflot to a kind of cul-de-sac by the church of St. Germain Lasserat. "'Ah, drunkard!' said he to him. "'Ah, traitor! You will then always prefer a bottle of wine to your friend.' "'Ah, Monsieur Chicot!' stammered the monk. "'What? I feed you, wretch! I give you drink! I fill your pockets and your stomach, and you betray me!' ah monsieur chicot you tell my secrets wretch dear friend hold your tongue you are but a sycophant and deserve punishment and the monk vigorous and strong powerful as a bull but overcome by wine and repentance remained without defending himself in the hands of chicot who shook him like a balloon full of air a punishment to me to your friend dear monsieur chicot "'Yes, to you,' said Chicot, striking him over the shoulders with his stick. "'Ah, if I were but fasting!' "'You would beat me, I suppose. I, your friend?' "'My friend? And you treat me thus?' "'He who loves well chastises well,' said Chicot, redoubling his proofs of friendship. "'Now,' said he, "'go and sleep at the Corn d'Amendance.' "'I can no longer see my way.' cried the monk, from whose eyes tears were falling. Ah, said Chicot, if you wept for the wine you have drunk, however, I will guide you. And taking the ass by the bridle, he led him to the hotel, where two men assisted Gorenflot to dismount, and led him up to the room which our readers already know. It is done, said the host, returning. He is in bed. Yes, and snoring. Very well, but as he will awake some day or other, Remember that I do not wish that he should know how he came here. Indeed, it will be better that he should not know that he has been out since the famous night when he made such a noise in the convent, and that he should believe that all that has passed since is a dream. Very well, Monsieur Chicot, but what has happened to the poor monk? A great misfortune. It appears that at Lyon he quarreled with an agent of Monsieur de Mayenne and killed him. Oh, mon Dieu! so that Monsieur de Mayenne has sworn that he will have him broken on the wheel. Make yourself easy, Monsieur. He shall not go out from here on any pretext. Good. And now, said Chicot as he went away, I must find the Duc d'Anjou. End of chapter 41. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia.